start right in. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our Sea Safety series. Uh, we, I am Megan Riley. I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the North American Marine Environment Protection Association, also known as NAMEPA. Uh, this is our second Sea Safety series uh, that we have had uh, this year, uh, but Quick about background of NAMEPA, we are a nonprofit whose mission is preserving, preserving the marine environment by promoting sustainable maritime industry best practices and educating the public to save our seas. We are joined by Carlene Leiden-Walker, who is our CEO and co-founder of NAMEPA. Carlene, do you have any words that you'd like to share quickly before we get started? No, we're just delighted to have these this uh, Safety at Sea uh, webinar series, which is this year's IMO World Maritime Day theme. Because as we know, mariners' safety is one of our most critical aspects of a successful commercial maritime industry. Well, thank you so much, Carlene. And I know we're super excited to meet our panelists. We are joined by some co-authors of 0.4, uh, How U.S. Leadership in Maritime Will Secure America's Future. This is a book that has just been published. It is available on Amazon, and if you had not had a chance to purchase it and read it, I highly recommend it. But as we dive into 0.4, uh, it was spearheaded by U.S. Coast Guard re re retired Rear Admiral James Watson. The book explores how the U.S. Merit and maritime nation finds itself on a precipice after World War II, uh, over half of the world's ocean-going commercial ships flew the U.S. flag. Today, it's less than 0.4%. From shortages in military support vessels to threats against the U.S. dollar-denominated trade, and from insufficient numbers of U.S. mariners for food and energy security to urgent needs for climate-resilient maritime operations, this book breaks down each issue and its root causes. Now, they don't just identify the problems, but the authors also present a 57-point action plan to revolutionize the maritime sector and transform America to be a leader in the blue economy. As the world grapples with uncertainty, America's resilience on a robust maritime sector has never been more crucial. And 0.4 just isn't a call to action, it's a roadmap to a more secure and valuable United States. Now I'd like to introduce our panel of co-authors for 0.4. Our first panelist, Rear Admiral James Watson, is who is currently an independent consulting pro consultant providing business development services to maritime clients. He held a position of Senior VP of the American Bureau of Shipping Global Government Services, where he was responsible for ABS's government market sector. He also served as the U.S. Coast Guard's Director of Prevention Policy for Marine Safety, Security, and Stewardship, and he was designated as the federal on-scene coordinator for the government-wide response of the Macondo incident in the Gulf of Mexico. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Marine Engineering from the U.S. Uh, United States Coast Guard Academy. He received his Master of Science in Naval Architecture, Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Michigan, and he also earned an additional Master of Science in Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. Rear Admiral, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Megan. Our second panelist, Carlene Leiden-Walker, who is the Chief Evolution Officer of Shipping Insight, leveraging her uh, off her experience as a marketing and communications professional in the uh, commercial maritime industry with over 40 years of experience. In 2015, Carlene was appointed as a Goodwill Maritime Ambassador by IMO. She's a member of WISTA, the Connecticut Maritime Association, Women in Maritime Association Caribbean, and is the past president of the Propeller Club of the Port of New York, New Jersey. She was also elected to the board of the New Era Academy at Baltimore Harbor School. She's also the CEO of Morgan Marketing and Communications, co-founder and CEO of NAMEPA, and founder of both Care of MEPA and the Consortium of International Maritime Heritage. In 2010, she was awarded the Certificate of Merit by the United States Coast Guard, and in 2014, a public service commendation for her work on World Maritime Day in Amber. Most recently in 2013, the United States Coast Guard presented her with a Distinguished Service Medal. Thank you so much for being here today, Carlene. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Megan. Our next panelist, the Jonathan Kempe, uh, leads Consource Consulting, an innovative strategic consultancy based in New Zealand. 
Prior to this, he held senior positions in large corporations, funding and running several small businesses, holding trusted roles in nationally accredited NFPs and NGOs, and providing technical services to Australian Defence Force sector. While running a Sydney-based Verify, Jonathan developed a deep experience in global supply chains, including the implementation of unique security solutions. He's well-connected within the Australian and New Zealand business communities, has lectured in universities and spoken at conferences around the world and regularly contributes to industry advocacy efforts through the uh, provisions of unique insights and research. Thanks so much for being here today, Jonathan. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Our next panelist, Nishan DeGrain, uh, is currently co-founder and managing partner of Exile Organization, a leading Silicon Valley technology and sustainability advisory firm. He has given keynote addresses to governments, United Nations agencies, the IUCN, World Bank, and IMF, and has worked with some of the biggest technology companies on breakthrough innovations for the ocean. Since 2013, Nishan has chaired the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on the Ocean. He sits on several boards and holds an undergraduate degree from the University of Cambridge and a postgraduate degree from Harvard's University Kennedy School of Government and International Economic Development. He's an author of Soul of the Sea for the Age of Algorithm published in 2017 and has won several international awards. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure, Megan. Thank you. And last but not least, Captain Anush Chopra, who is the co-founder of ESG Plus LLC, an international consulting firm focused on bringing sustainability, resiliency, efficiency, and independent broad advisory to clients invested in sustainable global maritime supply chain. Before his time at ESG Plus, Captain Chopra spent nearly a decade as Vice President Americas of Right Ship. He also served as the President of Anglo Eastern Houston and is had with direct oversight of vessels visiting U.S. ports, risk evaluation and government relations. Captain Chopra began his seafaring career as a deck cadet, working his way up to captain. He commanded large bulk carriers, tankers, and holds a Commonwealth Extra Master Certificate of Competency, Shipping Management Form in the Indian Institute of Management, and ACUE Certification. Captain Chopra currently serves as a fellow of the Nautical Institute, chairperson of the U.S. Gulf Branch, is on the board of directors at the Houston International Seafarer Center, advisory board member of the Houston Maritime Center, and is an adjunct professor for the Supply Chain and Logistics Technology Program at the University of Houston, where he has served as lecturer and teacher for more than 32 years. Thank you so much for joining us today, Captain. Thank you, Megan. Thank you so much. So we have a wide variety of um, speakers here today. So the first question I would like to pose to Rear Admiral Watson, as co-authors, you span a variety of maritime backgrounds as well as locations around the world. So how did this group come together to write this book? Well, you know, as your audience knows, I'm sure, maritime venues bring diverse people together. Uh, it's a worldwide uh, kind of industry to be involved with. And so, uh, when we got together at a, at a maritime venue, uh, it, we met and realized that we were all struggling with the same questions. You know, should we really care that so few Americans are skilled seagoing mariners? Uh, is, is the world so independent that foreign controlled ships are of little concern to us uh, in, in the United States? Are we missing opportunities? Um, you know, the U.S. is really not that committed to commercial international maritime, um, but we think it's critical to the world's climate and uh, political stability and orderly technology advancement um, that the U.S. be involved. So we decided to write the book and make it a kind of a call to action. Hmm. Now, Rear Admiral, from half a ball to less than half a percent of the world's ocean-going vessels, that's just 180 ships that are flying the U.S. flag. So why, why now? Why is it so important right now? Yeah, well, deep-sea-capable U.S.-registered commercial ships are essential for national security and prosperity. Um, the, you know, the numbers are stark. 99.6% are foreign flag ships. Uh, that are providing us with this global trade, both imports and exports. Only 0.4, which is less than 200 ships, uh, fly the stars and stripes and are capable of being in international trade. So the 
co-authors of 0.4 realize the magnitude of everybody's dependence on this international trade and on these foreign flag vessels. So we decided we needed a framework for questioning the adequacy of this U.S. dependence. And yeah, actually, after reading it, I hope the readers will want to study the maritime security uh, the way we have. Wonderful, thank you. Now, we were Admiral Watson, in the beginning, you mentioned the magnitude of our dependence on international trade and how little we control that. Can you touch upon that realization and the impact that has for the American people? Sure. Um, you know, not since the days of the Boston Tea Party has the United States seagoing maritime commercial fleet been so weak. Um, the the U.S. Declaration of Independence for Maritime is really at a low point in its entire history, 0.4 percent. Um, you know, even during I'm just thinking about our history, even during uh, our westward expansion and the isolation years leading up to World War II, World War One, um, the trading fleet of the under the U.S. flag was at least 10 percent. So. Uh, I guess we feel like there could be some consequences for national security, economic security, energy and food security, climate security, and workforce security. Um, we think the U.S. requires over 1,100 commercial vessels to support a prolonged overseas security operation and continue our economic competitiveness and maintain energy and food supplies, as opposed to the 180 that we have now. Um, frankly, even political disruptions like the current that we currently have in Ukraine and Gaza, the Korean Peninsula, the Red Sea, they're amplified by the fact that the, the ships there are non-U.S. crewed, uh, non-U.S. operated, and mostly non-U.S. owned. Um, the post-World War II commercial maritime world order is at risk due to so little direct U.S. participation in this industry. Some people might say it's okay for the Navy to have such a small merchant marine to protect and okay for the merchant marine to be too small to support the Navy. That's pretty much the situation as it is. I disagree. I point to the collapse of the Soviet Union and every other would-be great power as proof. China certainly would disagree. China has grown its merchant marine from 5% to 15% in the last 20 years and was able to build a navy using their homegrown maritime economies of scale. Americans should care about maritime control of the global supply chain. U.S. dollars used for over 90% of foreign exchange transactions. Between 80 to 90% of the produced and consumed goods in the world move by sea. International traders, ship owners, buyers, they decide what currency to use. What if they change their mind and stop using the U.S. dollar? Following the COVID-19 pandemic, U.S. inflation spiked when foreign crude ships were held up. Now, Houthi terrorists are causing flag of convenience ships to go around Africa. Americans have almost no fleet of our own. Our, our saying is no ships, no shopping. We I want that on a Oops, lining. Uh, I, I really think there's a silver lining. Um, you know, over the next 20 to 30 years, the entire global shipping fleet will be replaced. Every aspect of the ship's design, operations, propulsion, navigation, all that's going to change over that time. The climate change is driving a lot of, of, of new things, including the, the trading patterns, uh, the cargoes, both dry and liquid bulk commodities, and the port infrastructures. So U.S. investors can find uh, that they can invest in this transition and I think do quite well. Um, there's now going to be new maritime technology and a new sense of, I think, maritime competitive, competitiveness uh, to uh, be a part of the, this, this global transition. Um, most importantly, I think, young Americans can rediscover maritime careers. There's no civilian career that offers more travel, more responsibility, more financial stability, more service to country, and more camaraderie at work and free time at home than working in the maritime. Growing the U.S. fleet from 0.4 to 4 percent 
would attract thousands of ambitious young men and women. And I think they'd have a great career while assuring our national security and the prosperity that uh, we would hope to have between now and 2050. Thank you so much. Now, Rear Admiral, can you talk about the dual use program and the double counting conundrum and how can we move towards implementing the dual use program and mitigating the double counting that was mentioned in the national security principle? Yeah. Well, um, it's it's feasible that any available domestic asset might be one day used in a war effort. Um, there's probably three flaws with the position that we have right now in the United States. Um, yes, ships will be needed that way, but uh, those ships that are in domestic service, which is the most of the deep sea fleet that we have, they would have to be capable and ready to handle the more extreme conditions of the open ocean and a contested military environment, um, which they're not really thinking about at any time right now or have been in the, in the near past. So uh, that would be a concern. Secondly, an appropriate crew would be needed. Um, we, I talked about there, there's really a need for more people, young people in the maritime profession in this country. And in this case, if we're going to have a fleet of commercial ships that supports military operations, these people would have to be trained and they would have to be exercised and be ready to uh, interoperate with the US Navy. Um, and finally, uh, the current assumption is that we would pull these deep sea ships out of their current activities, which are also critical to our, um, our national security because our national security depends on our economy and on the normal activities of moving, say, oil and gas and moving uh, food and uh, containers to Puerto Rico and Hawaii and Alaska and so on. Uh, so assuming that you could simply just pull all those ships away and put them in service on the other side of the world uh, to support a military operation, um, well, I think that would cause a serious reduction in our national productivity and output, which is needed to support any kind of operation like that. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that I know is on my mind, and I'm sure you know, a lot of on a lot of people's minds is cybersecurity and the crucial role that it plays in maritime, especially with the integration of modern technologies and modern threats, which increase intensity almost daily. So how can the maritime industry keep pace with these emerging threats? Yeah, well, cybersecurity has to start with trusted shipboard equipment. Um, you know, there has to be trusted operators, trusted technicians that are going to service the equipment and tight control on all those interfaces that we have on modern, you know, ships uh, between the systems on the ships and the, and the Internet, quite frankly. A, a lot of information is flowing back and forth. Uh, that takes, uh, you know, some some real concern by the ship's crew, by the operating company, and even by the flag state of the ship. So uh, that's one thing that, you know, is a big concern to me by our dependence on foreign flagships. Um, the other thing is attacks and cyber disruptions are constantly occurring. You know, all companies are experiencing that, and so maritime is too. Um, but maritime shipping is actually critical to about 10 other critical U.S. infrastructures. Um, you know, when you think about uh, the, 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 the criticality of ports and of uh, energy and food security and those sorts of things, uh, why would you not worry about the cybersecurity of the ships that are supporting those other critical needs of the country? One of the things that we call out in the book is the importance of groups like the Maritime Transportation System Information Sharing and Analysis Center, that's called MITSNAT, um, MTS ISAC. And, uh, you know, the Coast Guard is also uh, standing up uh, and is already uh, moving out with its uh, Coast Guard Cyber Command. 
So you, you need groups that are going to uh, work closely with the industry on monitoring. And of course you need government people to respond and to investigate um, these incidents. Thank you so much for Admiral. Now, toward the end of uh, the national security principle, you, you talk about um, different risks and solutions, lack of understanding, incomplete support uh, fleet, just to name a few, but which of these risks do you feel is the most pertinent risk that we need to address right now? Well, my, my bottom line is knowledge is power. And so, you know, making people knowledgeable, you know, having them actually understand you know what what we're talking about here, uh, as opposed to just having things show up on the shelf in in stores and having uh, you know if you work in a factory you know just equipment coming in and and not knowing how it got there, uh, but actually having an understanding of international maritime I think is 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 the key, and once we expand that knowledge across America. Uh, I think as simple as it sounds, uh, you know, that will be critical to the future of, of the U.S. Merchant Marine um, and will go a long term, a long, a long way toward, um, you know, getting at these national security risks. Uh, again, we, we, we don't look at just national security in terms of national defense. We look at it in terms of our economic security and our food and uh, fuel and uh, fuel and, and energy security, our workforce security, our climate security. Um, so these things, I think, do affect people's everyday life. Um, and it is something that they need to, I think, take a personal interest in because it does have personal effect on just about everybody in the country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, moving into our economic security principle, Jonathan, how does our compromised maritime security impact economic security? Yeah, thanks so much for the question. Thanks for allowing us to elaborate a bit more on the book and talk through some of these concepts. It's a pleasure to meet you, Megan, and, and thanks to the audience for joining. Um, the two concepts that generally and historically have been held at sort of arm's length actually converge and have been converging more specifically over a longer period of time and, and in the modern era with to great effect. Uh, you just have to look at the events in the Red Sea at the moment to see how economic security, the movement of shipping commerce around the world, both in terms of tankers and in terms of containerized trade, is being impacted by military operations. The two come clanging together. And, and what we've realized, and globalization has promoted this to a higher degree and, and with a higher degree of tempo, in particular over the last five to 10 years, is that as people expand their economic footprint around the world, that economic footprint needs to be secured because it's primarily being moved by ships. About 80 to 90% of all traded goods move on ships. And so as that trade moves around the world, historically, and you're talking a long time back, that was protected by navies. And, and these days, the US Navy plays an admirable role in protecting shipping around the world. And as we, we're watching play out on our screens every day, um, the US Navy is doing an incredible job of protecting international shipping. And so you see those two concepts, which generally would be kept apart, come clanging together in the maritime environment. Economic security, which is the ability of a nation to ensure that it can feed its people, grow its economy, supply its people with the things that they need to be sustainable and to grow, is now critical to be protected by national security assets, not just in a local sense, but in a global sense as well. And so the book explores those sorts of topics and expounds on them in a way which I think it, it, for perhaps the first time in a long time makes a unique claim about why um, compounding those two things together is so important. And in particular, as it relates to the maritime environment. Mm -hmm. Now, all leading container handling ports worldwide are located currently in the Asia Pacific region. Largest in the U.S. is only able to take about 10.7 million TEUs compared to Shanghai's 47 million TEUs. So how can the U.S. grow its imports and, and catch up in this large gap? 
Yeah, it's important to recognise that economic powerhouses exist around the world with different functions. So in um, the Asia-Pacific region, for instance, and I'm located in New Zealand, I'm Australian by birth and descent, but up through the Asia-Pacific region, you see you have seen over a long period of time an expansion in manufacturing and supply, and it's concentrated in certain areas. And so the United States has a certain economic footprint. It is actually the largest uh, producer of, of a lot of things. You look at the GDP around the world, nearly accounting for a quarter of all total GDP. So an economic powerhouse in its own right. But in terms of shipping and the movement of goods between different nations, um, the US is dwarfed in many instances by the throughput of a bunch of these different ports. And, and that's because the origin of various materials comes from there. Raw materials, for instance, come from our part of the world down in Australia. We dig up our backyard and send it up into Asia. They turn it into manufactured goods and they move it around the world. And so the movement of things is generally the push and pull of economic trade. And um, how does the US build that? Well, simply put, it looks at economic security as a critical imperative, and then it starts to stoke those fires of economic development so that imports and exports can move freely. And one of the things that we talk about in the book is that it has to be linked specifically and critically to the movement of goods on ships, of which the United States does not control a huge volume on the open ocean. Mm -hmm. Now, Jonathan, why hasn't the US been investing in the maritime trade, but continuing investments through other economic interests? Yeah, so if you look at this in terms of multiple sectors, perhaps you'd think of space or you'd think of automotive, you'd think of the technology sector or the finance sector. The United States is a clear leader in all of those. It's, it's unequivocal. You just have to call out all the names of all the car manufacturers around the world. The United States will feature in the top 10 quite easily in terms of space with SpaceX just recently, but NASA over a longer period of time. And um, the US is a, a world leader. In terms of defense technologies, the US is a world leader. In terms of aviation, two of the largest companies in the world, um, and, and a lot of the US domestic fleet is supported by US built assets. But in maritime, completely anemic. There hasn't been an investment for a long period of time in the maritime sector in terms of new port capacity, in terms of building ships on, in country. There's a whole bunch of different things that have fallen by the wayside because it hasn't been prioritised. There's been some initiatives to try and improve the flow of goods through ports. There have been some initiatives to promote certain commercial aspects of maritime, but there hasn't been a focused degree of investment in the maritime domain. And that's for a litany of reasons, and our book expounds on some of those reasons. Uh, a few of them that I think will be really interesting to the audience, which they can read through themselves. Um, but what we're arguing, and I, and I think Jim's touched on this already, it's a really important time to focus on those things because there can be a huge return of, on investment inside maritime, but that the issues need to be understood and then, and then intelligently invested in over time. Mm -hmm. and Jonathan, a quote that I pulled from this, economic security is national security. So can you explain this risk and why it might be misunderstood? Yeah, so I touched on that just in the introduction, but just to highlight this with a quote um, from Alfred Mahan, who we quote in the book pretty lib liberally, um, who's a, a historian and he was a, a maritime um, genius from a, a while back and, and wrote a lot of the theory that underpins a lot of things, including global trade today. Um, he, he very explicitly uh, linked those two things together. He says that naval power must be built on maritime um, capability and commerce. Um, he, he saw the importance in those two things. Um, and, and when you see the movement of ships now, they have to be chaperoned, they have to be secure as they move. And that's been taken for granted for some period of time. Now, as of right now, we're seeing that whole paradigm fall apart. And so if the United States is serious about what will happen in this next epoch, this next decade or so, perhaps to get from 0 0.4 to, to 0 0.40, to actually have 4.0% of the world's fleet, which is, is quite an acceleration in terms of volume, um, they'll, they'll have to be a, a specific focus on ensuring that those assets that move on the ocean are secured. Mm -hmm. And as you do that, as you apply national security principles, you'll actually ensure economic security can come to pass in a sustainable fashion. Wonderful. Thank you. And Jonathan, do you see a scenario where a foreign adversary could threaten U.S. economic interests? Well, we've actually already seen that. It, it just didn't come to pass in the way that could have been both aggressive and potentially massively disruptive. We saw that over COVID. If anyone saw the car park of ships or the boat park of ships off LALB, that was a form of economic disruption 
and was an economic security risk because of the the um, volume of, of goods that were piling up trying to get into those ports, but also then posed a national security risk. It was very difficult to try and filter all of that volume or make sure all of that volume had all the cargo that they, te they technically said was on board. And so there is a, a an issue here with economic security that raises its head when it comes to times like that of disruption. So we've already seen a template of that. We're seeing a template of that in the Red Sea. We're seeing a template of the build-up of that in the Mediterranean at the moment. Um, these sorts of things should be critical lessons for us to then learn from so that these historic mistakes don't repeat. And, and our book explores all those topics in, in greater detail. Wonderful, thank you. Now, moving into our uh, energy and food security, Captain Chopra, what is when is it come when it comes to food and energy? How are we at risk? Um, great point. Thank you, Megan. Uh, thank you for that question. So, uh, you know, you you have to perhaps uh, break it up into two. Uh, on the energy side, we know how typical energy flows have been in the world, and. Uh, from the Middle East, they have flown, but there are new energy giants like Russia or, and as well as uh, uh, Venezuela and some of the others who've come to pass and played a major role in that space. With these choke points, as uh, uh, Admiral Watson brought it up and as Jono brought up, they're choking up those uh, transit points. I mean, we know, for example, at this time, the Panama Canal traffic is down because there's less rain, so there's less water in the Gatun Lake. Uh, so the transits are down dramatically. We know that Suez Canal today, uh, uh, because of uh, Red Sea issues, uh, uh, is down to maybe 20%, depends who you speak with. So it's uh, we take our energy for granted. And when we were talking about dual use of ships, if, like Admiral Watson said, that all the ships which were in the U.S. were used for defense, we need certain amount of critical infrastructure within the U.S. to service itself. For example, the flow of uh, uh, products like gasoline uh, from U.S. Gulf all the way to the Northeast or Florida. So all those factors would come in. So energy security is critical. The uh, U.S. is actually in a good place at this time where we have excess and we are a major exporter in the world, perhaps one of the largest exporters in that space. Coming to food security, again, it's the same story. Uh, in US, we are blessed to uh, uh, grow a huge amount of grain, have great reserves, and at the same time, trying to help uh, people who've not been so fortunate, you know, where there, where there have been famines and there have been natural calamities in that space. Today, because of this, we are not able to reach those spaces. And a lot of that aid is actually getting choked and even losing its value because people are still going hungry. Remember, uh, a ship is stuck at Anchorage, like we were saying, uh, but uh, somebody who's expecting a meal because they can't get one from anywhere else, that is critical for them. So there is a food flow being played out uh, just as an example, when we saw uh, uh, in the last five years, we've seen this flow of, uh, uh, you know, climate change, where rain, we had rain and drought in different parts of the world. This caused excess production in certain parts of the world, but um, a massive reduction. And we had countries, for example, which stopped the export of rice. Now, there's a significant part of the world for them, a meal is not complete without rice. And we just saw the weaponization of rice. We know that with the Black Sea issue, uh, the Ukraine-Russian conflict, which is on, that has put a massive grain shortage in the Mediterranean because their grain bowl was coming from the Black Sea. So as much as uh, uh, food and trade flows were normal, they're slowly getting weaponized into a place where uh, having that critical infrastructure is very important for us. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we've tried to explore in this book and share our thoughts with it. 
Thank you. Now, Captain, you mentioned that the U.S. is one of the larger exports of oil and gas, but our tanker fleet is on the smaller side for non-Jonac carriage, and there are no U.S. flag gas carriers. So much of what Americans use to fuel their cars and heat their homes cannot be transported on planes or other modes of transportation. So how can the U.S. correct this imbalance and secure its energy needs? Great point, uh, Megan, and I'm from Houston, and I'll share a fact with you. So the Houston Ship Channel is the largest LPG exporter in the world. And like you rightly said, we don't even have a single ship which with a US flag on it, which is a gas carrier. And there is much more to explore there. So uh, it's good to let marketplaces, you know, the marketplace dictate supply and demand and price be found. But there's some important elements of national security which comes into the space. And that goes for oil and gas, that goes for technology. That, uh, if you recall, we had that vessel called Ever Given uh, get stuck in the Suez Canal. And that's when folks realized that supply chains were not coming out of the shelves of Walmart, but they were coming actually on ships across the oceans. How many people during that, uh, uh, you know, that Christmas break, uh, how much, uh, how, how many gifts didn't arrive? Uh, we've heard so many stories in that space that Thanksgiving mm -hmm. uh, gifts didn't work very well that year. And then, of course, uh, uh, of course, COVID didn't help much with all of us. But uh, looking at maritime, we've managed to make uh, the maritime supply chain very efficient. Uh, some of the experts say that we are in that 95% efficiency. The problem with that is it does not have any elasticity. And when you have these natural or geopolitical uh, calamities uh, is when uh, uh, it doesn't work. So it's important for nations to have that residual amount of resources which they can use in elements, in places, in times, exactly what Admiral Watson was mentioning, mm -hmm. uh, in different theaters, which are really needed at this time. Mm -hmm. Now, Captain, you talked about rice being weaponized and, and humans need to eat, and that kind of shows the role that shipping plays, but why don't we fully understand the significance that shipping plays in food security? Uh, I guess one of, uh, uh, one of the biggest points there is uh, I thought, in the US, uh, we have planned this well, and we are blessed well. Uh, we, we produce in excess of what we consume, and we store it, and we export it. Uh, I don't know if many of the people on this call are aware that more than 70% of global aid, including all the agencies in the world, is actually going out of the US and paid for by the US taxpayer. So not only are we exporting food, but we give our money because we believe that everybody has the opportunity to at least have a square meal. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are the challenges which are coming in. Uh, we've seen in Africa where drought on drought has been going on, and then it suddenly converts to floods. South Sudan is getting floods continuously. We are seeing massive amount of strife and hunger at this time in Sudan. Uh, we know Gaza is uh, on everybody's mind, and we are talking mm -hmm. about uh, you know uh, uh, more than three hundred thousand people who are really uh, uh, unable to get their food security done. But it's just around perhaps two point two million people. Uh, if you compare that to Sudan, where it's sitting at about seven point three million people, and it's there are just so many disasters unrolling in that space. If we don't get our, uh, our maritime security, our maritime resources available to us, at least we will, we'll be able to reach them. It's like saying we don't have the ambulances to reach when a person has had an accident. We are mm. waiting for a market force to bring that ambulance, uh, to bring, it, bring that in. So we mm. feel that critical infrastructure uh, is where maritime comes in. And I think uh, many of us have highlighted that fact. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, uh, a quote that I pulled from the climate security um, section, no water, no life, no blue, no green. The climate is changing, the ocean is changing, and with over 50,000 vessels burning fuel, Nishan, how do you propose we start that change? It, it's uh, it's interesting when it comes to the maritime sector because on one level the maritime sector is on the front line of climate change. You know, the ocean is one of the biggest drivers of our climate, and every time we see uh, changes of any models of climate, which the UN and UNFCCC are uh, looking at, it's because of a new understanding of the oceans, right? And so, so the front lines are more extreme weather will manifest itself in the ocean, but at the same time, uh, the current maritime sector is a big driver. It's the sixth largest emitter if it was a nation state, um, larger than France and Germany combined, just behind Japan. Um, but as uh, Admiral Watson mentioned at the beginning, there's, there's a terrific opportunity here. You know, we are in this massive green transition around the world. And if the entire fleet is going to transform itself in every aspect from its propulsion system to its navigation system to its energy supply chains, where are the opportunities? And in the maritime domain, there are six or seven really key kind of fuel systems. And this is where the US is in an incredibly unique position. Many of the technologies and what it will take to actually be on the front line exist within the US. You know, uh, John, uh, Jonathan Kempe mentioned, you know, what's happening in the automotive section and the aviation sector. Here in the US, we're, we, we had, we're at the forefront of the battery revolution of small nuclear modular um, uh, reactors, uh, the bioeconomy using methanol and other forms of fuels, electrification. So the US could be at the forefront of this energy revolution in maritime. What it will take is just new leadership uh, from a from an institutional perspective and the right sort of um, uh, bureau, you know, in institutional infrastructure to, to drive the change. Mm -hmm. Now, resilience is no longer just a practical concern due to climate change. It's now a critical characteristic. Nishan, can you elaborate on this? And what can the US do? And what have you highlighted in this principle that can be done? I think what's important here is is not just what the U.S. can do, but what what are other nations doing right now? Um, because climate is a cre a critical competitive differentiator as well. When you look right now, uh, China has advanced more um, uh, vessels that are uh, going on electrification and um, and developing a lot of autonomous systems uh, for itself. You see uh, the Scandinavian country, Norway and Sweden developing new barge and ferry systems that are fully electrified, Germany and UK. And so you ask the question, well, where's the US in this American domain? And so can the US uh, differentiate itself? We're seeing new business models. We, we're, we're going to see $70 trillion of wealth transfer from one generation to the next over the next decade. So you have this younger generation of consumers and producers and new CEOs who are looking for greener methods and uh, of transparency of how they transport goods. And so what are the new new models um you know esg had a mixed reputation in the in the press recently um but those themes of sustainability are opening up technologies and so how do we use uh, data and e-commerce platforms to force that transparency to bring about new business models and how can the us become a a, a competitive leader in that space rather than a laggard and, and be defined by other nations uh, what the energy of preference needs to be so that's where the opportunity is to build the right institution create a galvanizing for almost like a ARPA Maritime, we talk about where are the big moonshots that we can see. Can we create an ARPA Maritime to bring together the best thinkers and the best innovators on, uh, on spearheading the maritime revolution um, that can be mm -hmm. grown here in the US? Now, Nishan, why is the US underinvesting in this critical area? That's a great question. <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, I think you've heard of the consensus with all of us. I mean, it's a huge opportunity. You know, the, 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 the profits are being made from the maritime sector, what, three, four hundred billion dollars, the majority of which are going to foreign owned vessels. Over the course of the pandemic, I think something like 17 billion dollars went towards um, alleviating the supply chain. But a lot of those benefits accrued to foreign vessel owners. If there was a greater number of US flagged vessels, US owned vessels, that would be retained domestically here within within the US. Why is there not a great commercial sector? Well, yeah, there's a lot of historical legacy reasons um, that we, we, we've talked about, but there's an opportunity here to just to bring the, the leadership together. So you know, one of the questions is, you know, can we bring together the public and the private sector? This is something that goes beyond any one individual area. Captain Chopra talked about, um, you know, 
do we leave this to the free market? Sometimes we need to have a bit of a, a guide to the free market to channel the resources. And can the public sector be a catalyst to the private sector to leverage a huge amount of, um, of, of debt? Yeah, we have the most sophisticated financial system in New York. What do we do with maritime insurance? What are the new financial products that can be created? What are the innovative, the venture capital uh, funds? How can that be deployed in, in your innovative way? So we have all of the individuals there, but there's no forum to bring this together. So how do we create that forcing mechanism uh, to bring the right individuals together to be a catalyst for change? That's what's needed. The, 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 the revenues and the profit margins are very clear. Um, someone in the US just needs to step up and, and drive this forward. Mm -hmm. Now, Jonathan had also mentioned this, but uh, how has the Red Sea conflict impacted marine environments and emissions? in a climate security sector? I think I think there are a couple of aspects to this. You know, clearly navigating around um, around the whole of Africa has added a huge amount of uh, emissions in terms of longer voyages. But I think the other aspect is the risk. Um, you know, we have fuel tankers going through that could be targeted. Um, in Sudan, uh, not Sudan, uh, up, up Yemen, there was a big old storage uh, vessel, the um, FSO Safer, that you know was a legacy from the previous conflicts. If that had leaked, that would have created, um, you know, Red Sea. We have to bear in mind how environmentally sensitive this is. The Red Sea is one of our few last remaining coral sanctuaries that has actually got coral reefs that are thriving in warmer waters, whereas 90% of our corals around the world are suffering from bleaching. So there's something incredibly unique around that entire marine ecosystem that stretches from um, Yemen through to Saudi Arabia through to, to uh, Egypt. We're only just discovering the potential of this. So before we lose to pollution, we need to actually understand the genetics of why this, this coral reef uh, ecosystem is thriving and the other marine life that goes that goes with it. And so the risk is if any of these vessels are targeted and hit from the Houthi conflict, at least a major oil spill, we are at risk of losing decades of uh, you know, genomic and incredibly uh, important biodiversity kind of resources. So that's you know, the second risk in addition to you know, sending vessels that much longer or even using a, you know, aviation to you know, fly out a critical uh, goods from a you know, certain region of the world. Um, I know that's something that certain companies have been doing as well. So um, there's kind of three kind of big environmental risks there that, that I see because of the Red Sea conflict. Thank you so much, Nishan. Moving into our workforce security, uh, the U.S. flag fleet, there's an estimated shortfall of 5,000 mariners. Globally, that number is 96,000 mariners short by 2026. And that's a large amount of seafarers we need to find. So, Carlene, how do we find those mariners and how do we increase the number of Americans on board vessels? Well, first off, I think one of the things we have to get back to is what uh, Jim Watson mentioned, which is no shipping, no shopping. There's a disconnect between uh, general public's awareness of its relationship to shipping and dependence on shipping and their recognition that there's a career opportunity there. So we need to educate the public about that value proposition of the maritime industry so that they understand, A, their dependence on it, and B, the opportunities that are um, available in that industry. So we need to uh, identify what is the exact shortfall because the 5,000 is a round number, but we need to be a little bit more specific on where the qualified mariners are, what our shortfalls are, and how do we reach into the public in order to do a better job of recruiting. And one of the things that we know is that Gen Z has changed, is a different, different animal. Um, certainly a different animal than my gen, but one of the most important aspects of it is connectivity. So we have to ensure that we meet potential mariners where they are without compromising the safety and the integrity and the service that maritime industry provides. Hmm. No shipping, no shopping should be on a t-shirt. I like it. Uh, You'll get one. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, the lack of U.S. flagged vessels engaged in international training means that there's a lack of, um, of Americans at sea, which in turn means that there are less vessels that would be able to assist in the military during times of war. How might we be able to ca uh, combat this? Well, one of the proposals that we make in the book is a reflagging uh, proposal in order to bolster our U.S. flag fleet. Uh, and that would mean taking a look at what tonnage is out there that's U.S. owned 
and finding a mechanism similar to the uh, Maritime Security Program, the MSP program, that streamlines the process of bringing more ships into the U.S. flag. And with that, I think one of our greatest challenges will be the workforce security. Now, if it were a perfect world, of course, everybody on a U.S. flag vessel is a U.S. flag mariner. We might have to look at other options for bringing mariners on board, have the officers U.S. mariners, but possibly find other sources of maritime professionals um, and provide them an opportunity for uh, joining a U.S. flag vessel, you know, perhaps a program, which um, the, the military, by the way, uses this. This as a mechanism for recruiting soldiers. And after a certain number of years of service in the U.S. Merchant Marine, you can obtain residency or potentially even citizenship. That might be attractive to some. But a lot of what we need to do is communicate that the industry exists, that there are jobs there, look at underserved communities, and perhaps do a better job um, with 50% of the talent pool, which are women. So there are lots of pockets of opportunity, but if something were to happen tomorrow, um, we'd we'd be scrambling because it takes a lot of years to train up people. Now, it doesn't you don't necessarily have to do 4 years at a maritime academy in order to become a trained maritime professional. We have a system in our in our industry called hawse piping where you can come to the industry, go through the training, get your sea time and work up the ladder or the into the hawse pipe, work up the chain into the hawse pipe of a vessel. So there are a lot of pathways, but again, a challenge is public doesn't know that there's an industry. It's up to us um, and programs like MIPSIC, for instance. NAMEPA runs the Maritime Primary and Secondary Education uh, Coalition, and that's bringing over 200 schools together with industry so that industry can help uh, the schools understand that there are jobs and we're helping identify what those pathways are for students who might see this as a as a true career and a calling. Thank you. Uh, at the end of our workforce security section in this book, you can discuss some of the solutions and opportunities proposed. Can you talk about which one you think is most pertinent for us to focus on right now? Well, I think as we've all been saying, we don't have enough ships. Without enough ships, we don't have the berths for mariners. So I do think that that reflagging program is an essential tool for securing um, our national security and all of the other securities we're talking about. And that will be the driver of building up our workforce. I do know, I was with Dr. Shashi Kumar a couple of weeks ago, and I do know that Merad, is, he's published his uh, strategy for workforce development. I'm looking forward to learning more about that. But in the meantime, every aspect of the maritime industry needs to be engaged with that. And part of it could be industry-sponsored scholarship programs, um, developing a mariner, a maritime incentive and research program, um, expanding the military to mariner. We have a lot of veterans out there who bring the principles that are important in shipping of discipline and, and hard work um, that might be recruited into our industry for a glamorous life at sea. So there are a lot of different programs that could be deployed, uh, but we have to take action today because mm -hmm. we don't want to wait to have a national emergency in order to recognize our vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carly. These five principles, which are incredibly important, separate, but Rear Admiral, how do they all relate and how can we start that process today? Oh, Rear Admiral, I think Sorry. you're on mute. Yeah. I'm back. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And it's a great question. Uh, I mean, that's really at the core of our uh, framework, it, which is to uh, make the case that shipping and, and specifically U.S. flag shipping is essential to uh, all these forms of 
you know, national security. It's, it, it, it goes beyond just supporting our Defense Department. And I think what we're suggesting is that the, uh, the country has evolved to where uh, the only, a lot of perception is the only purpose for a U.S. merchant marine fleet is to support the Navy. Um, and uh, Jonathan Kempe referred to uh, Mahan. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, the Navy is supposed to support a nation's merchant marine. Um, and the Navy should have a very large merchant marine, especially a large Navy should have a large merchant marine to select from um, when it needs uh, that kind of support, which it doesn't need every day, um, but it needs it in a, in a crisis. Uh, so, what needs to be done is to have a strong, viable, everyday, you know, profitable uh, U.S. merchant marine. And, and we feel very confident that things are changing uh, when you think about the, the climate changes, when you think about the world political changes, when you think about, uh, you know, the differences between how we uh, eat, <laughs> Um, as Americans, we, we no longer just grow things in our own garden and harvest our own wheat and just survive on that. We do a lot of exporting of those products and then we import probably as much or more uh, on ships. If you suddenly uh, pulled the plug on all the ships with refrigerated uh, containers, bringing in our bananas and our strawberries and our meats from other parts of the world, you would have a quite upset American public. So that same thing applies to, um, you know, refined uh, uh, energy products. Uh, yes, we are the largest net exporter, but guess what? We're still importing uh, nearly the same amount of uh, oil and gas products as we ex export. And that's just the way it works. That's, that's efficiency. And ships are what makes that um, that world efficiency work. Um, and to have so little ships in the system uh, is a bit scary to us. So mm -hmm. we 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 do think all these things work together. If if you have ships, you will have mariners too, because it is mm -hmm. a great career. Uh, there's there's probably one main reason in in my mind that we don't have a very large merchant marine in terms of uh, numbers of people, and that's because we don't have a very large fleet. If, if uh, people saw that the fleet was growing instead of shrinking, they would jump on that career, in my opinion. I would also argue that um, we would love to see the buildup of our shipbuilding industrial base um, for over the long term. I think that should be a national goal for the United States. Uh, so we have what we offer in the book are short, medium, and long-term um, action plans to make sure that when it comes to maritime security, as a nation, we're covered for national, economic, energy, uh, climate, and workforce securities. Thank you. Now I want to squeeze in one last question, and this is for the entire panel. So one at a time, uh, but looking ahead, what are some key recommendations from 0.4 for policymakers and military leaders to strengthen U.S. leadership in maritime affairs and secure America's future? We're Admiral, I'll start with you. Oh, I was hoping you would ask uh, Jonathan Kempe. I, I think he's done a great job of, you know, pulling together thoughts from all of us. And as you mentioned right up front, we're a diverse group. So we have a, a, a diverse, uh, I think, wonderful uh, 57 recommendations that address all of these issues. Uh, Jonathan, what, what do you think would be the, maybe the, the top you know, two or three in your, your mind? Thanks, Jim. That's a it's great, it's great to be able to fill that question. Uh, I think just to start with, I'd probably break it into two different things. To start with, there needs to be an enhanced understanding of the opportunity space. Um, it's difficult if you think about shipping as just a singular activity that doesn't affect everyday life, when in effect it does. The maritime environment is critical 
to the sustainability of countries, to the growth of economies, to people's daily lives and, and how they are sustained over a period of